Hi again, and welcome to a webinar on a peer support definition in Nebraska. My name is Amy Holmes, and I am the outreach coordinator for Beacon, the Behavioral Health Education Center of Nebraska. I have just a few things to review very quickly, and then I'll turn things over to our presenter. The organization I work for is called Beacon, and we're here to support the behavioral health workforce in Nebraska, which of course includes peers. You can check out more information on our website if you're interested in the organization as a whole. But our initiative to support our peer support workforce is called Project Propel. You can learn more about this at the link there at the bottom of your screen. We've received a lot of great questions from all of you regarding service definitions, and we'll do our best to get to those today. But if we aren't able to get to all of them, I'll be sure that we get answers out to you as soon as possible via email. If you have a question that you'd like to ask during the presentation today, you can enter it into the question box, which should be on your screen if you logged in through your computer. If you're calling in via phone, you can email me any questions that you have during the presentation, and if we have time, we'll get to those too. You should have access to a handout also in your dialog box, and this is a copy of our state regulations as they relate to service definitions, just for your reference there. So I'll let Alan go ahead and uh, unmute himself and uh, let him tell you a little bit more about himself and his organization, and we'll get started with the presentation. Well, good morning, everybody. I, I don't know if it's such a good thing to unmute me, but uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, as Amy said, I'm, I'm executive director of the Mental Health Association. Uh, we're located in Lincoln. Uh, as far as I know, we're still the only peer-run service provider in the state, and, and we're working with Beacon and uh, the Kim Foundation and, and basically trying to formalize peer support, helping DHHS, uh, DBH, formalize peer support with, uh, you know, in, in anticipation of Medicaid, but also to, to strengthen uh, the, the, uh, the mode of service that peer support is so it isn't turned into something that, that we would rather not see it be. Um, Again, we are, uh, we've been around for quite a while. I've been with MHA for now over 11 years. We are CARF accredited, and we provide supported employment services and then crisis diversion services, including two crisis respite houses, uh, Kia House and Hanu. Hanu is with the Department of Corrections, and we have also a, a, a reentry grant from the Department of Corrections to help folks that are getting out of the state system but are living with behavioral health issues, helping them uh, transition back into the community. So that's kind of an overview of that. Uh, I guess, are we on to the next one? Again, we kind of mentioned what, you know, what the purpose of this is. Um, our first charge basically is to help a, uh, DBH with uh, the, uh, the writing of a service definition for peer support. It's one of the things that's been a confusion in the state. I think the different regions might have their own definition. I know in Region 5 they don't have one for peer support, but they do for recovery support. But anyway, to try to get us all on the same page. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the process, uh, what that's going to be, and then basically, you know, I think maybe talk a little bit about uh, the process to get everybody's stuff. Because again, we don't want to just do this by ourselves. We need everybody's input into the process. Next. I'm going to go ahead and um, launch a poll here to ask you all a question about how much you know about service definitions. So if you have that up on our, your computer, if you could click on the answer that best represents your knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the one that's, I know, just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> Give you about uh, 20 more seconds here to answer. Okay. 
All right. There are your results. It's not too bad. <clears throat> um, well, from my knowledge of it anyway, the service definitions are what DBH and DHHS use to basically justify uh, uh, paying out or, or reimbursing for services or some kind of compensation for providing a service. Um, like I said, in, in Region 5, uh, the closest thing they have is recovery support. Um, and I heard, uh, I was talking with Amy a little earlier that Region 1 has one for peer support. It isn't necessarily tied to Medicaid, but the idea is that they be written uh, to the extent that they could be used by Medicaid for reimbursable services. So again, that's one reason why we have to be careful and thorough with how we how we craft it. Next, or what do we have? Uh, this is uh, um, this is the recovery support. I, I can hardly see it. Sorry. That's okay. This was the um, the. Uh advertisement for a job oh okay yeah you know not to throw an organization under the bus but this was very timely that came through uh, last week that is a job description for an employment specialist slash peer support and I believe it's associated with an act team but what what I found rather interesting is that, that if you read through and the, the, the requirements you'll see that there is no requirement for lived experience. And when they talk about education, there's no requirement of really knowledge or of or training in peer support or recovery-oriented services. And this is really kind of an example of why uh, it's important that we craft something as soon as possible, because if we don't all get together and do this and, 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 and do it to our so that it meets all our needs, uh, somebody else is going to do it for us. Um, the next one we have is a, a copy of the one, the, the recovery support uh, service definition from Region 5. This one is actually in the 206 regs. Um, none of the other ones that I've found are, are listed under the service definitions in, in 206. But you'll see even here with the recovery support, um, at the bottom it says personal recovery experiences is preferred for all positions, not required. And again, that is another reason why we need to lock this down so that there's no confusion what peer support is. I think uh, we've all worked very hard to make peer support a legitimate uh, and very effective service. And now that it is at that stage, there's going to be a lot of people, more, more traditional folks, that may be wanting to use this or claim this also. So it's, it, again, it's just the emphasis of why we need to formalize this. Next. I don't know if I'm going too fast. I, are you getting any questions or anything like that, Amy? Or I, We do or have just a couple. Stop me. No, that's fine. I think we have a couple questions, but we can go ahead and um, answer those in order once we go through the slides here. Oh, OK, yeah. I don't have them, so yeah, if you could just, when they do come up and when you want, just signal. Sure. Do you want to talk a little bit about the process then, the, the regulation process? Sure. Um, if you have uh, the screen up in front of you, it shows you the steps uh, that we all go through. Um, and in this case, the Division of Behavioral Health would go through in order to get um, new language, something new into our state regulations. And right now we're in the first phase, which is the rule drafting period. So basically you're trying to get as much input as you can from as many experts as you can to figure out what exactly should this regulation say. And as you can see there, um, during the rule drafting period, it, it's very important to solicit input. And I would say we're even getting a jump on this because not only do we have the ability to collect input from all of you through Project Propel, there have already been a lot of really great efforts to get feedback from people across the state on 
a service definition. Uh, there's been efforts through the OCA in collaboration with the Public Policy Center. Um, I know that, that other efforts have been going on out there. And so as we're going through this, and trying to figure out what this should look like, we'll take into account all the work that's been done already. Um, in addition to what we hope we're going to gather from you here over the next month or so. But after we get some ideas about what we want this to look like, um, we'll share those with the Division of Behavioral Health, and they will take those into account, like I said, in addition to all the work that's already been done, and write up what they think um, they want this service definition to say. Uh, there's a period where they have to um, make that available to the public, um, hold a hearing, um, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the process so that um, people in the public are allowed to come in and, and make comments. And then it goes through a process with the um, Attorney General, uh, the Secretary of State. Sorry, Attorney General isn't involved in this. No, yes, he is. Secretary of State, uh, the Governor. And then it will be a part of our permanent state regulations. So you can see here that because this is such an involved process, um, it's something we want to take very seriously. And we want to try to do as much right as we can um, as we're, we're developing this because it's, it's hard to get it changed. It's not impossible, but um, it's a big process. So hopefully that helps you understand why we're taking it so seriously and um, want to get as much input as we can. And I'll just go ahead and move into the questions um, that we've received so far, Ellen, unless you have something else to say on that. No, that's fine. Thank you. I think the first one you almost, well, let's see. Uh, definition, certified peer support specialist in a way for them to legally, uh, oh, for an organization. I'm sorry, I'm so prepared here. Um, I think again, this is this is kind of confusing the issue with what we're doing now, and and then even getting it accepted as far as a Medicaid reimbursable service. Uh, because I think a lot of any new services, where, where MHA was very fortunate, we got into all what we're doing with uh, the, the flow-through dollars as they uh, started shutting down the state hospitals and stuff like that. And that's what we are operating under now. A lot of the new services are going to require something like Medicaid to go through. Um, and so a lot of the things that, that we will be uh, discussing in the, in the Medicaid process um, like the prior authorization and clinical supervision, um, those are the two biggest issues that I have with Medicaid reimbursable services at this point for peer support because uh, at least for myself and our organization, we view, view very strongly that it's the individual that is driving this process, not a clinician. And a, a program like Kia House, if somebody wanted to go into Kia House on a Saturday night, you know, how do they find somebody, a clinician, to get to sign off on it? And then even, you know, or would that be eligible for eight hours or 24 hours of peer support if that person needed that type of, of uh, level of, of intervention um, during their stay? So there's a lot of questions there about, uh, you know, a, a peer-run service uh, business and stuff like that. Um, I think that there is a possibility that, that a hybrid could be done. I know across the country there are a number of them that are uh, peer programs run out of a, a, a traditional service provider or a clinical type provider. Uh, the challenges there obviously are if the, the organization or the supervisors actually let the peers do peer support work and don't morph them into doing med management or case management or or those types of activities. Again, that's one of the things during the process of this project. I'd like to to uh, get a list of, of what you know. What do we see peer support as being, and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable under a recovery-based model? Um, does that kind of take care of the first one? I think so. I don't think there's anything that would prevent 
Um, I'm looking at the first part of the question. I don't think there's anything that would pre prevent um, someone from owning a business, if I'm understanding that correctly, whether there's a, you know, a, a supervision requirement from a clinician or not, um, anyone should be able to own a business. Yeah, the trick would be how you're going to pay for it. Right. And I, I think in, I can say with, with other um, professions, um, behavioral health professions, if there is a supervision requirement, a clinical supervision requirement, you can choose um, who it is that you want to do that supervision. And I think maybe that gets to the last part of the question there. Yeah, kind of even into the next one. Yeah. Uh, as to when it would be billable. Um, I've also been uh, working with uh, and visiting with folks from Magellan on this aspect. Uh, and the word I get is that, that, it, that it could be possible to craft our own, uh, what is it, a waiver? Medicaid waiver to fit what we need. Um, again, the the, uh, the 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 big the big issue is, you know, what does that actually look like, and how do we go about doing that? Um, the thing about it being in the near future, uh, I, I I don't know. I, I don't myself don't see it. I know though that again, for the expansion of peer support across the state, without an influx of uh, DVH type dollars. Uh, it is going to be contingent on something like Medicaid for it to happen, and 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 again, I don't want to move too fast that we that we lock something in that maybe we realize uh, doesn't quite work. But the process, as Amy kind of uh, outlined a, a slide or so back, with the service definition, kind of runs with regulations on this also. So it isn't anything that's going to happen overnight. I I would imagine. You know, this is a year, if not a, you know, going on two-year process to get it all done. And that's if we can all agree on stuff. And again, the third question is kind of, uh, you know, Amy kind of uh, alluded to it that DBH is in the OCA has already done a lot of work with this, the peer group. Uh, the what is it? The I can't. Remember. I don't quite remember what the panel was that, that uh, Carol put together, but I know that you guys have, have done a lot of work in this area with the peer support conference and stuff like that. Uh, we don't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel. I think part of this process is also going to see what's going on in other states and whether or not it'll work here. And and and, and again, it's it's to use as much information and get as much help as we can from as many people as we can to make sure that whatever is crafted and approved meets our needs. Um, again, I think Amy kind of spoke to the role of DBH. Everything that we do, we has to go through DBH and then they, uh, you know, change it, add to it, fix it, whatever, uh, and then they approve it and then pass it on. And then they go uh, uh, review process. Um, so we do uh, need to, want to, and uh, uh, work with DBH very, very strongly in this process. Again, so that what we do end up with it actually meets the needs for not only the peers, but the folks seeking out peer support services and the state as a whole. Um, the, the training and facilitator training, I know that uh, that's been one of our frustrations over the years. And uh, what we started doing was our own training and then uh, have t then taking the, the uh, state test to, for the certification. Um, that's something else we could look at. I think that it is important that there's a, a fairly standardized training. Um, we definitely need to work out a way to monitor that, who's going to do the testing, who's going to collect and monitor all the CEUs, all those types of things too, so that everybody stays, uh, you know, is, is up to date on, on the standards and, and, and practices uh, after that. Um, I think that kind of covers that one, unless somebody has some other questions there. Um, 
and then again, yeah, the, the next one about people taking facilitator training and then they don't facilitate. Um, I'm not quite sure. I, I, I heard that there's, what, 260 thereabouts uh, certified peer specialists in the state. I haven't really seen a number as to how many of that, I mean, how many of those folks are actually working uh, because that's one of the other things that we have to work at. You know, I mean, people take the training but then can't get a job, and, and we want to see and, and make sure that that's, that that's being done. And I think also as we hone this process down and, and really, you know, put the definition of peer support in, in concrete, as it were, it'll, it'll start being more used, I think, in more traditional settings. And even as there is the... Uh, the integration of, of healthcare, you know, the, the physical with the mental health, uh, behavioral health, you know, there's going to be opportunities I, I could see too for peers in, in the physical health world. So hopefully once this all gets going, it will open up the job market and then the more opportunities there are would then drive the process for more, the need for more training and more certified people. Um, and I just we just kind of mentioned the the different levels depending on the types of training. Um, I could see that, that that could occur too again because I think that that all peers would operate under the same uh, uh, general model of, of recovery recovery oriented services, but also could be specialized again in physical health and and some of the other areas that could be done. Um, this is just the beginning, folks. I think it, it's really kind of an exciting process. And as we continue to help it grow to where it needs to be, I think it's, it's just going to increase the opportunities for folks. OK, we've got a lot of questions coming in um, through the question box here. So I'll go ahead and read some of those to you. Uh, you talked about this a little bit, but we're getting a pretty consistent question here. Um, are you trying to change what a peer-to-peer -peer specialist does or performs? Um, no, not necessarily. I think, again, where the confusion that we see anyway, and, and that we've been working with the different peers in Region 5 uh, that are in the more traditional settings, uh, we hear a lot of frustration with the fact that, that they're being asked to do things that they don't consider to be necessarily peer support work. Again, everything from med management to case management um, to, to doing assessments and, and those types of things that, that generally are not conducive to a recovery-oriented model. Um, so, yeah, well, we're not necessarily trying to change it and stuff like that. We, we, we want to hone it down. Um, I mean, I definitely have my own vision of what it is, but this affects everybody, so we need everybody's input into what this is. And hopefully, you know, we might not all get everything we want, but uh, we'll definitely get what needs to be done to make this a very viable and legitimate service. Another question here is, um, if peer support becomes Medicaid reimbursable, will the dollars made available through Health and Human Services or DBH no longer be available? Uh, that's one of my big questions that I've raised because, again, all our peer support services are uh, our expense reimbursement, the, the non-fee-for-service type uh, activity. And so we have, we have contracts, like contracts that do supported employment, and contracts to do hospital diversion with Kia House, um, our Hanu Home and the services with uh, the, the, the reentry with corrections, those are paid for by the Department of Corrections and so not really on the table here. But it could eventually be that way also. Um, so that is a big question for me because we get a significant amount of money to fund our programming and, you know, do we have to start from square one with just Medicaid or, or can we build upon what we already have in place with our existing contracts. Uh, so that's a, that's a question we need to get answered. And I do know in other states that um, a combined funding model or a blended funding model has been used to pay for peer support services that includes um, Medicaid dollars, um, money from whoever their state 
health and human services type agency is. Um, some folks have charitable monies that come in there too. And it looks like if they have the, the multiple funding sources, then it helps to be able to keep, you know, the, the service flexible um, so that if one payer doesn't pay for something, another source may pay for it. And that way, you know, obviously you, you, you don't have to compromise um, at least as much in order to meet the requirements of your payer source. Yeah, definitely. It, it definitely takes a lot of different avenues. We've had problems with that, and it's kind of been sorted out over the last couple of years with our supported employment program because in addition to our contract with DBH, we also had a contract with Voc Rehab, and uh, there was some uh, confusion, maybe the potential for blurring of lines as to where the dollars, what the dollars are actually going for, um, the, you know, the possibility of double dipping kind of a thing, you know, are we getting paid twice for the same service? Uh, and so that whole program was morphed into one that was using milestones with, with specific activities being re, uh, paid for by DBH and, and certain uh, milestones being paid for by VR. You know, that might be what it might look like, um, but I, I as, as long as the, the, the main dollars are protected and, and that is a process that is usable, um, I think that that, uh, that that probably will be the future. Okay, another question here. Um, how is what we're talking about today going to affect people who are peer specialists who volunteer their time and do not charge for their services? Um, honestly, I think that if it's, uh, you know, th what these are really tied to are the is, is the compensation from the state. I think, though, I know that we, in a, we have a, about 34 uh, paid staff now here at MHA, but we have a cadre of probably, it fluctuates between a dozen and 18 volunteers that work alongside the paid peer support workers, and actually we hire out of our volunteer pool. Um, uh, so I, I don't know, I, 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 I would like everybody to be working under the, you know, I think in a perfect world, everybody is working under the same standards, and I think that it's very important for a program and a service to be uh, consistent that everybody is doing pretty much the same thing. So uh, I don't think it's anything to make a barrier for a volunteer. But I think actually that that level of structure, I think, could actually help the volunteer process. I would definitely like to see the expansion of the volunteer. But I also want to get away from this this uh, notion that is held by a lot of the traditionals out there that peer support should be voluntary, kind of like AA. You know, the that the the peers in AA aren't compensated, so why should the peers with mental health be compensated? Um, and my argument is that this is a very, uh, not only a very effective, it's an evidence-based practice, everybody's highly trained, and uh, if peers shouldn't get paid, maybe clinicians shouldn't get paid either. So it, it, it's all part of the process, um, but hopefully this, this will all just strengthen us all together over the big course of the, thing, of the whole project. Another question here, should Nebraska's service definition mimic other states in order to have continuity and to have a reciprocal agreement established? I think that that, that could be advantageous, but again, it needs to meet the needs it needs to meet the needs of our people that are that are living here. Uh, folks that are living in a, a very big urban area, New York City, LA, something like that. They're, what they need might be a little different than what is needed out in Scott's Bluff. Um, so again, I think there needs to be a sufficient gray area around it. But I do, I think that, that advantageous, I think that it would be like any of the others, like, like uh, uh, social work or, or um, uh, the licensed mental health practitioner type models. You know, they, there is a, a standardization that does allow that reciprocity and that, that moving back and forth. One of the other things that's kind of tied to this too is what about the folks that have been practicing and, and, and providing peer support as we push the new certification and everything else? Uh, is there going to be the opportunity to grandfather in? 
or does everybody start from ground one? You know, I think uh, uh, so. The, not only the reciprocity, but also the grandfathering of folks that have already been in need to be part of this discussion, also. Sure. I have a question here about liability insurance for someone in a peer position. Um, that I would have to say you better talk to a lawyer. And since the other person on this call is a lawyer, it would probably be better than that. <laughs> but um, I know for our organization, we carry a lot of insurance. Um, you know, again, we treat it just as any other type of service. And uh, so we have it. I, you know, so I, and again, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, so but I would think that as long as we are not counseling, as long as we are not directing a certain course of action, that we aren't monitoring medications when we're unqualified or or licensed to do so, as long as we stick within the realm of the services that we provide, I think we should be fairly safe. But you never know, and, and liability insurance could also be. You know, if you have any kind of an office and somebody comes in and they trip over the carpet, you're going to want something there too. So it's not only, you know, the outcomes of, of what is said or what isn't said, but it, you know, liability can come in a lot of different areas. And that's something too. I could take a look at uh, what other states are doing and get that information out. I think a big part of this too is is again monitoring what's going on in the other states so that, uh, you know. I kind of half joked when I talked to folks across the country that, you know, I finally found an advantage of being 20 years behind the curve. You know that we in Nebraska we are we do have the benefit of looking what else, we'll see what other people are doing, so that maybe we can avoid uh, some of those mistakes that they that they did. I know that that's what we did when we brought Kia and and crisis diversion to Nebraska. We used an existing model and then morphed it to fit what we needed. We didn't start from scratch, so you know I think it's just that that would just be expedient, you know, to to, to try to build upon what everybody else has already accomplished. I have one question here: um, How will we move forward to develop these definitions and gain input from peer supporters statewide? Well, again, that's what uh, we're we're talking with Deacon and and the Kim Foundation on. Uh, the, you know they're they're willing to to provide us with with some resources so that we can maybe hire somebody to facilitate this statewide discussion. And that's kind of what we're looking at in and, and that process. Uh, we've done it before with uh, the white paper that that Melissa Lemer uh, put together about five years ago. Um, you know, so the, we'll either do it this way with uh, conference calls and webinars. Or it could even be town hall meetings across the state. Um, we're we're looking at all different possibilities and and you know what's feasible with the resources that we have. But it is going to require everybody's input. I mean, none of us are as smart as all of us, and 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 we're all involved in this, and we all have a stake in this. And uh, so I think that's our strength is is working together. And I put out um, <clears throat> an email today. <clears throat> excuse me, um, asking for volunteers to um, lead some efforts in each region of the state so that we can, you know, efficiently gather feedback by region um, and funnel that back to Project Propel uh, so that we can be sure to get a quick turnaround on, on the feedback statewide. So that's a great question. And um, while Alan and the folks at MHA work on uh, getting their person hired there, hopefully to to provide some of this leadership. Uh, Beacon will will keep sending stuff out and and organizing things as best we can. Yeah, it's always the devil in the details, I guess, sort okay. of thing. Another question here, and then I've got a couple more up on the slide for you. Uh, will we be able to keep the definition broad enough to allow for all types of peer support? yet not try to put us into med management or case management roles? I'm certainly hoping that that could be the case. Um, again, uh, you know, peer support can take a lot of different uh, faces. And, uh, you know, we, we use it, uh, I mean, with our houses and especially with the, our, our reentry program for corrections, we're working with a lot of people that have substance use uh, 
you know, backgrounds and stuff like that. And, and we're finding that, that our work has been very, very successful with helping people uh, get off their, the, the substances and stuff like that that they are on by just using peer support. You know, it isn't uh, the, the, the classic uh, 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 substance abuse treatment type thing that requires all those hours of, of clinical, you know, working under people and stuff like that. Uh, really, the models that we use are very similar. There isn't a whole lot of difference, but there could be some little nuances, especially with language and requirements as far as wherever you're working, that would have to be taken into consideration also. I, for us, anyway, the, the, the core fundamental aspect that we have to be careful of is who actually is running the process and that we do not take control away from the individual to be able to make decisions for themselves. Is it possible for us to define different peer support services with different service definitions? Um, possibly, uh, or we could craft peer support uh, with enough gray area to be able to morph into what comes out. Uh, you know, I, I, one of a lot of what we're we've been doing here at MHA. If we go back a couple years, it wouldn't have been, even been on our radar. So who knows what folks are going to think of next next week or next year or in five years. So we definitely want this. Well, the whole regulation and the whole service definition process is, it may seem like it's all embedded in concrete, but it is a living document and can be changed and, 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 and put into a position, you know, evolve into something that, that meets the needs of the day and not stuck in what we were doing yesterday. So again, I know I'm talking kind of vague about it, but I would like to see it either uh, open enough with our center, with our main service definition, and then tweak that, or at least have the ability to uh, to change it. Um, I, I really don't see, though, a whole lot of difference between, like I said, the way we do uh, peer support for mental health versus peer support for substance use. Peer support is pretty much peer support. Maybe you take a look at the questions up on the screen there, and those are the last two we have. Well, that's kind of what you know we're saying about the, uh, you know, how do we make sure that that peer support is is adheres to the model that that we come up with and we all agree on, and and not be uh, morphed into something that that isn't isn't what it's for. One of the things that I would like to have be part of this process uh, and the discussion statewide is actually even coming up with a set of fidelity measures so that they can be used to make sure that, that services that are being provided are adhering to, a, to this specific model. And that can be everything from uh, the, the scope of services provided to the level of involvement uh, the individual has in the process. You know, across the board, I would like to see that so that not only uh, as new pro programs, existing programs are, are put together the correct way and new ones are, are implemented correctly, but also that, that we can all monitor it and make sure that, that the programs are uh, continually doing the highest level of services possible. Um, so, yeah, th these are definitely the... These are what the challenges are, you know, on what those essential duties are and stuff. I, I, again, we have a very specific view of what we see peer support being, which might not be the same as everybody else. And so that, that's the whole benefit of everybody coming together and sharing it and then coming up with a common, uh, a, a common understanding and, and a common acceptance of, uh, of what this model actually is. So maybe we can talk a little bit about um, what we see happening next, Alan. Well, again, yeah, we need to. Uh, uh, well, we need to talk to the to our generous benefactors uh, and find out about you know contracts and all that fun stuff. I'm one of those that I, I need to see it in writing. But uh, we're going to hire somebody as soon as possible to get this process going. Again, uh, it. it this is something we just don't do in a month. This this is going to be a long, fairly long-term uh, process to be able to not only get everybody's input and craft uh, a document that is acceptable or documents that are acceptable to DBH, 
um, but also you know to make sure that we're covering all our bases that that again we don't end up with something that we really don't want um, and that uh, I just can't stress enough though that it, this requires everybody to be a part of this um, I, I I don't pretend to have all the answers I definitely have my my own view of what it would look like but again that isn't necessarily what everybody else's is and so uh, we're all in this together and uh, was that the old notion says nothing about us without us so us is all of us so we all need to be involved in this so I'm um, anticipating that uh, DBH will um, share with us I think right now they're consolidating kind of all the work that they've um, done via the OCA and, and the Public Policy Center like we talked about before and they'll get that to to us. Um, I think we talked about the first of November. And once we have that, we'll share that with all of you, uh, give you an idea of, of the information that's been collected so far. And at that time, we want to get additional input from you. Um, I sent out a, a request today, like I said, for um, Project Propel leaders in each region of the state. So I would ask those leaders then to help us collect that feedback specifically related to the service definition so that we can get that back to DBH. And that needs to be a pretty quick turnaround time. Um, Ellen, I can't remember exactly when we said we'd have that back to them, but um, I would think less than a month. We need to have all of our feedback consolidated and back to DBH, but I'll double check on that. So yeah. Can, and. Uh, did you, were you able to get in touch with Cynthia on the, on the... I, I couldn't get in, in touch with her. I'm not sure if she's on here or not. Uh, it's my understanding that, that she will be the, the go-to person at, at the OCA and the DBH during this process. Yes. Yeah, so, so I don't see her here. Cynthia Harris is the um, interim director of the Office of Consumer Affairs, and she's been um, who we've been working with on this so far. And, um, oh, Marlene says Cynthia's on vacation. That's why she's not on here. Well, good for her. Yeah. Uh, but we'll keep working with her. Um, so in the meantime, if you all could review um, the materials that uh, we've included in the, the webinar today. And when I send out some follow-up information, I'll have copies of um, the service definition that we shared um, for recovery specialists. And I'm getting good feedback from a lot of the different regions on the um, service definitions that they have in place, uh, which may be different from region to region. But I think that's good information for us to review too. And so if you can start reviewing all of this and, and thinking about all of these things now, I think it'll help us get our feedback um, across the state consolidated and turned around as quickly as possible. So I put some questions up there on the screen, uh, things for you to think about uh, while we're waiting to get more information from DBH. And then please just keep an eye out um, for more information via email on uh, the feedback that's needed. Um, I have a couple things here too. Um, if you haven't been receiving regular emails from me, um, Amy Holmes at Beacon, please shoot me an email and let me know so that I can get you on um, that mailing list. Um, Cynthia Harris through the OCA is also uh, sending out emails to her email list. So hopefully we're uh, capturing as many people as we possibly can. So um, just let me know if you're not getting that. I talked about more information coming in November, and then there is um, a link if you are interested in providing some leadership in your particular region of the state. Please um, click on this link there at the, the screen. Um, it should be at the bottom of the slide, and you can fill out your contact information, and that'll come to me so I can get you on the, the list of, of leaders. And other than that, Alan, I think we've... Um, answered all of the questions that have come in. We have had a couple of requests um, to provide um, 
a copy of all the questions that have been asked and then maybe written answers, if that's possible. Um, so I'm happy to work on that. And, and Alan, I don't know if you'll have time to do that, but um, looks like a lot of folks would appreciate that. Yeah, if, uh, if, if you have a good idea of what the questions are, I can, I'm sure I can hopefully remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and um, conclude the webinar today, unless you had any other comments, Alan. No, no. I, I just really appreciate everybody being involved. Uh, my little screen says that there are 24 people. That, that's excellent. And, uh, um, let's just let's all take this seriously and work on this and and this is a great opportunity folks I can't can't stress that enough and uh, that, that we can have definite strong and meaningful input into how the rest of the state handles or views the jobs that we are doing and if uh, you know the, the big lesson here is that if we can't figure out how to do it ourselves somebody else will do it for us and I'm I'm so oppositional that I I would you know I I like to have a little more control than having somebody else decide for me. So we need everybody involved. So spread the word if you will. We're counting on you not only to participate but let other people know too that that their input is welcome and um, and needed. Um, this presentation will be recorded and, and made available, so you can certainly share that with other folks too. Um, we appreciate you getting the word out. But thanks, everybody. We look forward to working with you all on this and hope you have a great afternoon. Yep. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Amy, for setting this up. No problem. Take care.